Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Newborn, pronouns she, her, hers, and I serve as the director of the Human Resources Department for the City of St. Paul and the Chief Equity Officer. Happy Juneteenth. So happy to be here with you all and share in celebrating this special moment. I'm here to introduce our next artist. Junada, yes, I apologize, I wanted to say something else. Junada Petrus Nassa. Junada is a creative artist, activist, writer, playwright, and multi-dimensional performance artist who is born on Dakota land, West Indian descended, and African sourced. Her work centers around black wildness, love that, futurism, ancestral healing, sweetness, spectacle, and shimmer. She is influenced by the Middle Passage and diaspora, black folks in Minneapolis, ancestral magic, and stories of queerness and womanhood within these contexts. Speculative fiction and magical realist elements are central to her work. Junada has written a book. Her book, The Stars and the Blackness Between Them, is a Coretta Scott King honor book. She has a children's book, Give, Give the Police Department to the Grandmothers, coming out on May 2020, 2023 on Penguin Books. I'm happy to introduce and present Junada. Happy Juneteenth, joyous Juneteenth. I feel like that's the way we gotta say it. Um, yeah, I feel like this month, June has become a time where I feel like we truly get to slow down. I think like Black History Month has been cute and important for all of these decades, but there's something about honoring the ancestors in warmth and sun at like the dawn of kind of like limitlessness in Minnesota. Like, I think whenever it starts to get warm and things get to melt and things come alive, um, I come alive. And so it feels good to see how Juneteenth has really sort of blossomed again in our communities. And um, yeah, I just wanted to give people an opportunity um, to just, okay, sorry. I could have opened my book before I got up here, but I needed to have an awkward moment, clearly. Um, but as my um, introduction shared, like so much of my work is around honoring ancestors. And it was so beautiful for Thomasina, actually, who's obviously like her voice is a healing elixir. Like there's nothing that could be not healed by your voice. And getting to not just hear her sing, but bring in the ancestors. So much of Thomasina's work is holding the ancestors with her creativity. And so much of kind of my legacy of artistry comes from artists like her, who aren't just about like, okay, expressing artistry through themselves, but see themselves as a legacy of vessels. Um, and when I think of the ancestors specifically of Juneteenth, I try to humanize them in their specificity, that there were some ancestors that might have been stoic and strong. There might have some that have been weak, some that have been fierce, some fancy, some queer, some elder, some young, some babies that, just like there's so many different kinds of people in this room, there were so many different kinds of ancestors. Just like we're extremely intimate with our existence, you know, so, when I think of my ancestors, I try not to just make them this mass of humanity, but a specific individual with a life and a desire for their own existence. Um, and as we hold Juneteenth, I want us to think specifically of our ancestors, the ones we know, the ones we don't know, the ones we dream of, the ones who dreamed of us. 
Um, yeah, and I, I include that specifically for people who are of European descent in the space too. I think that like those ancestors definitely also need to be brought into the space and healed on behalf of. Because when we talk about Juneteenth, there were not just the people who were freed, not just the people who were doing the freeing, but still people stuck in that mentality that we need to keep people under bondage for our existence. And I think that right now in this country, we're definitely, I don't even know if we're going through a reckoning as much as a revealing. You know, like that all of those legacies of enslavement, of colonization, of erasure, of oppression, have never left <laughs> this land. They never have, you know? So I feel like Juneteenth, being with artistry, honoring these ancestors is our part of the rituals for us to really come to this place where we don't have to live in fear and we can truly live in joyous jubilee. Know what I'm saying? Know what I mean? Um, so I have, I'm gonna find this page where I wrote down all my notes. Uh, okay, here it is, right here. Um, yeah, so I just wanted us to like, just take a breath, you know, like, so just like, you know, hold a part of your body, it could just, be your hands, it could be someplace real subtle, but if you feel interested in just holding a part of your body, filling up your body with air and releasing. Doing it one more time. And releasing. Settling more into your body, settling more into this moment. Breathing in again. Releasing, feeling all of the sacred beings, all of the ancestors in this room, both of our blood, both of this land, of our dreams, and just coming and arriving in this moment with me. So, um, I have a poem um, that is a specific one that kind of to me reminds me of Juneteenth. Let me pull it up. Hmm, here we go. It's called Ancestor Song for the Brokenhearted. Is it? It's in here, y'all. I'm sorry. Thank you. I have like this like complex about taking my time, so thank you. <laughs> Ancestor song for the brokenhearted. Baby, love, child. Luminous in your blood is hurricane survivals. Moonlit childbirths with shackled feet. Back, whip, lash. In you, men who know bush magic, women who summon souls to this realm and release souls from it. Your souls knows other rivers, yes. This experiment obscures your soul in this machine. They will whisper you ghost in your own face. You ask where they do that at. You see, we transcended the science long time. They don't know us, in us, Sweetness is here, kissing at all things broken or confused. You are safe, universal, limitless, sacred, sensual, divine, and free. So that's Ancestor Song for the Brokenhearted. Um, thank you for that little clap. <laughs>
Um, so um, I wrote a book called The Stars and the Blackness Between Them, which is a young adult novel that I think is accessible for all ages. Honestly, I think so much of adulthood is healing your young self, your child self, uh, listening to your young self in ways that nobody may have listened to you as a young person. And um, this book centers around two girls, um, one from Trinidad, one from Minneapolis, um, having like a healing journey with each other. And um, while uh, one of them discovers that she has a serious illness, and as a part of her journey to heal um, with her friend, um, she discovers this book called also the stars and the blackness between them that's written by a man on death row, uh, Afua Mahmoud, who has been on death row essentially since he was a teenager. And a lot of um, what I try to do as a practice with my own existence is to sort of look at the legacies of existence that still exist. I feel like the prison industrial complex is a direct descendant of the you know, enslavement that existed on this land. Um, and was uh, orchestrated to be that way. So in this book, I have a character who's incarcerated and I find it important to include that geography in um, my stories. I think that like, I don't want to ever forget um, my family that's you know locked up behind bars, which there's millions and millions of people in this country and often um, for reasons that are very uh, related to the ongoing racism and white supremacy that's a part of this nation. So this character of Fua is so beautiful and is an astrologer. And um, I just wanted to share just a little piece from his part of the book. Uh, and this is from his memoir in the book. Incarceration is a sustained lifetime lynching meant to discard your soul and make a shell of you in plain life make you into your monster self, the beast that comes out when your forces survive in the absence of love and safety. Never mind that most of us were broken and traumatized. We still are no longer worth our own humanity. We are a criminal. We need punishment and to be rehabilitated. We need shame and exclusion. We are not worthy of control of our own lives. We are hopeless and evil. We are not individuals or of a womb or a family. We are not absent from anywhere else because we are here. We simply non-exist. The world is better without us. In this society, we are taught that our crimes are the summations of our lives and define the limits of our possibility. Our only potential is to harm and destroy. But I was a boy once. And to be honest, I can't help but hold and carry him inside of me. Most of us here is holding and carrying a scared and lonely child inside of us. How could we not? I write this story for the little Afua in me that needs to know he is okay and worthy of life, even if my whole existence is a reminder that my breath will one day be taken away at a predetermined time by an executioner whose house I live in. I protect the young boy's soul by reminding him he is infinite like the stars and the blackness between them. So that's a little bit from the book from Afua's perspective. Thank you. Y'all, okay, so y'all, I really love that Thomasina's in the front row. So y'all got to like be doused with her singing and all that. But like Thomasina is like my big sister. You know, my brother married her when I was young, like eight. No, no, no. Y'all met when I was like eight, nine, got married when I was 12 because she a lady. And um, I really appreciated just over all these years before I even knew within me that there was an artist in me that I got to see someone take over stages at the Guthrie at Penumbra, countless like, you know, dinner venues, the Dakota. Um, and really hold this legacy of our ancestors. So one thing that you talked about, and I almost wish we would have did our little thing together, low key. We will do one thing together. But like, there's a lot of, like when you talk about Bessie Smith, when you talk about um, Billie Holiday, these were black women that were supposed to be maids. That in our 
country's imagination, the only imagination they had for black women were to be maids and to be servants in one way or another. So a lot of the wildness and joy that I think black women in particular, and I think all women have to thank black women for in this society, was actually carving a space for joy, expression, creativity, wildness. Um, also like a lot of Billie Holiday songs and Bessie Smith songs and the blues songs was the first time women got to speak about sexuality at all. You know, so like I feel that when we think about Juneteenth to just not kind of see these stoic ancestors putting down the, the hoe, you know, but to really be like, no, nah, these were people ready for life. These were people who left these plantations and looked for lovers, looked for their parents, looked for connection, that they wanted to play the trumpet. And that like any time we enjoy music from the United States, it has the blues in it. You know, it has not just the blues and the sadness, but the blues speaks of desire. You know, we can't think about the oppression without thinking of the desire. Thank you, baby. The baby's like, yes. <laughs> you know, that we didn't just have to see our configuration as how do we build this country for white people to be happy, but how do we express existence and just be, you know, to just be. So anyways, I don't know. Y'all, when I get up on a mic, I do kind of get tangential. So I don't know. People still curate me for things. <laughs> okay, so what should I read next? I have, um, oh, I'll sing, I'll read Gemini season. So do folks in here love astrology? No pressure. Some, thank you, okay. What's your sign? Libra, my moon's in Libra. We could talk afterwards. Um, so in this book, as I mentioned, um, there's a character who's incarcerated who's an astrologer. And um, he writes all of this ancestral astrology poems. So currently, do y'all know what astrology season we're in? Thank you. Who's it? Are you Gemini? What's your sign? You don't have to tell me. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll know later. <laughs> so this one is called Gemini season. And I actually think this one is really fitting for Juneteenth, which is happens in Gemini season. Um, we was sister teaching brother how to read by oil lamp and moonlight. Ancestors deprived of power over our own minds and bodies, multitasking in plain sight. Singing blueprints to freedom while cutting cane and harvesting fields. We dream her in the library, in the future. Mercury mind, silver tongue, with books under her arm from each section. Her mind can't drink enough. It flies low on every possibility, wants to know all of the knowledges stolen from her ancestors that she ain't forget. She lays on her stomach and reads till her back hurts. She runs the distance of her yard seven times, the distance from past to future. She lays down and reads some more and remembers the ways that spirit flies through the night of mind shape-shifting seamless through duality, and she's one with her thoughts. She's whole in two parts. For Gemini season, um, let's see what else I got. Okay, so I ha okay, thank you. Well, y'all know, like, I've been a Zoom artist, I think, for, like, so much of the last two and a half years, so it's kind of like, just to see people's faces and body language and eyes, it's just, like, so good it's so good you know um so i have this poem called auntie um which i wrote in honor of my auntie brenda which you know thomasina knows my wife and kid know um but yes auntie so a lot of yeah we're just going to be reading some cute poems today auntie when you little no one tells you that your mama is depressed you gotta figure it out for yourself. But they will let you spend the night at their house to give your mama a break and slide beads on your braids like an abacus with a star of foil at the end. And they let you drink red Kool-Aid and Caribbean versions of American food like spaghetti and meatballs and let you and your sister and cousin dig and hustle out of their couch, purse and boyfriend, pennies, nickels, dimes and things which you would count out with no shame, slowly and precise on the counter of the corner store, 
No matter that the man who owns this place got no patience for black and native kids who keep him rich from their bottomless candy addictions. Way before the time of candy flavored blunts, we just counted change for little sweet things to devour and boredom and emptiness and hood existentialities. I would get star crunched by Lil Debbie and Cherry Jolly Ranchers. Things I fill my gut with until my gut be so full, I stop thinking other things that feel like heavy clouds on a little kid heart, tied to a mama in bed under a feeling that aches so dark. I bite the star crunch and the chocolate is so waxy and sweet and the crisps pop on my tongue and my back teeth are loose and chewing through the satisfying center of the treat. I crumple the wrappers into my pocket and run underneath the sky, looking at the clouds and I'm full of sweet things and feel perfectly sick and kind of gross. <laughs> Um, I have two more things to share. So this book, okay, so how do I talk about this? I feel like so much of my work as a young adult writer is to give kids permission to be what they want on all sorts of levels. And for me, I was definitely a kid that got therapy through reading a ton. Me and my librarian was like this son, and I definitely got to like leave and see the world through books. And um, I also sometimes got to see myself in books. And so a lot of the joy of being a writer is to actually sit with my young teen, Janata, and be like, well, what do you want to hear, girl? What you thinking? What you feeling? What you need? Um, so this is, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of what, sh okay, do y'all want to hear about somebody's first concert or somebody obsessed with Whitney Houston? I'm gonna let y'all choose. Oh, Lord. Okay. First concert. Okay. I'll read Whitney to everybody else and first concert to you later. Okay. Or maybe I'll do both. Shoot. Maybe do both. We'll see. Okay. Okay. So how many people knew that Whitney Houston was like sexually fluid, bisexual? Anybody knew that? Some people knew? Right. Um, a lot of kind of the way that she's kind of was central to this book as an ancestor was that like, I think a lot of us were huge fans of hers. And I don't think people realize kind of how magnificent she was, sadly, until she became an ancestor. You knew though. The baby's like, I knew, speak for them. <laughs> I was fully aware. Um, so like a lot of this book and, and talking about ancestors, so much particularly black artists who were bisexual, queer, gender non-conforming, a lot of them, and I could name countless, Luther Vandross, uh, Sylvester, Whitney, you know, Bessie Smith, Billie Holiday. These were all people that weren't, were free. You know, there's ways that they really were free, but because they had become so central to like art and personas, a lot of their existence got repressed. So anyways, this is the character Mabel, 16 year old girl in the book, and she's talking about her Whitney feelings. I love y'all, y'all are a good audience, by the way. You know, give a round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to sleep and I can't sleep. My belly hurts, my hips too. And all I can do is lie in bed and think of young Whitney Houston from the 80s. I have her album Whitney next to my bed. I found it at the thrift store last week when I was there with my mama and I've been sleeping next to Whitney every night ever since. My mom thinks it's cute since Whitney was her idol growing up and she was inspired by her singing and style and stuff. But I feel like Whitney and I are connected in a special way for some reason. I have loved her since I was a kid when my mom and I would play her greatest hits and dance to I Wanna Dance with Somebody. At the part when Whitney says, don't you wanna dance, say you wanna dance, don't you wanna dance? Mama would pull my dad in and he would do his reliable and raggedy two-step thinking he is killing the game and she would be in her intricate Afro-modern hip-hop choreography, which is a lot of shoulder shimmying, lyric dancing, and old lady twerking. My mom can dance though for real, and she could always get my dad to just let go and be goofy. Anyway, I'm up staring at my ceiling and my memories and my feels as usual, listening to my quiet storm mix, as my dad calls it. It's all emo and soft music, 
Soon I'm thinking of Whitney and her fine self from back in the day again. She just had a lot of layers to her, which is a thing I think I like in people, like Ursa and Jazzy. Even Terrell has layers. I like that sometimes Whitney was graceful and poised like a church lady, but she was really kind of wild and cray and straight hood too. I'm like that. I got a lot of layers. But I think other kids think I'm just this whatever tomboy, black girl who always reading and playing ball or working out or something. I basically fit in, which is okay, but sometimes I wish I felt comfortable to put more of myself out there. If I'm honest, part of my renewed curiosity is because recently I found out Whitney Houston fell in love with this other girl, Robin, when they were teens and working a summer job in New Jersey. I was just looking stuff up online and found some things about her rumored romance with her basketball player best friend. I don't know, but it just seems cool to know that she had this connection with this other girl and that the other girl was a beautiful basketball star and Whitney fell for her, called her the sister she never had. I feel that. I think I felt that way before with Ursa, my bestie. I felt that somewhat and in another kind of weird way with Jada, this girl from math. I read that when Whitney hit it big, Robin was her for real ride or die. That she became Whitney's assistant and her confidant and always had her back. For real, for real. They shared a huge apartment together that was bad and beautiful and was living that good life together. When I listened to I Wanna Dance with Somebody after reading more about their connection, I imagine Whitney and Robin slow dancing in an icy and lit penthouse in the 80s and it's all back in the day fresh. A world of windows, looking over the city, lights and skyscrapers, black and white everything with leather couches, sound system with mad tapes and CDs, glass tables, neon chandelier, old school and tasteful. They are two black girls, slow dancing, teen twin flames who loved each other, inseparable. I feel it. Anyway, some people deny it, but when I look at pictures of young Robin and Whitney and how they're smiling and close, a part of me thinks it's true. I just do. I can totally see why Whitney loved her. She is cool and smooth, more swag than any of those cheesy Jerry Curl, Curl dudes probably trying to push up on her. I also read that one time Robin also maybe whooped Bobby Brown's butt. I wanna be like that. Smooth like Robin, just a tender thug Whitney would love. Maybe Robin was her true love. I wish she could have stayed with her if that's what she wanted and that they'd be in love forever. Maybe the world would have loved Whitney if she was queer. I would have. Whitney was an angel, and what if Robin could have been her bodyguard? Why did that basic white boy, Kevin Costner, with no swag, have to save her? It should have been Robin's cool self. Ain't black women always saving everything anyway? Why can't we save Whitney? So that's my little Whitney moment. <laughs> okay. Are y'all good? Like, y'all ain't like... Because sometimes I'd be like, okay, good reader. I know you like your writing, but it's taking a moment and you're still up here. But I'm a, is, is it cool to read two more things? Okay. The first concert. I'll go to the first concert. Aww. Thank you, friend. So this is uh, the same character has uh, a first concert moment. And um, yeah, they're kind of like recounting a little moment they had with a girl at this show. The next song on my list is by my favorite band, Black Lovers. All of the musicians in the band are weird black kids. Like me, I guess. I really like the lead singer, Queen Asante Wa. I like them because they're just beautiful and different. They wear simple clothes and a fade haircut and sneakers. Their voice is really soft and deep and emotional, and they write most of the songs and play guitar. I think if I'm honest, I'm pretty sure I like girls. But I'm not really sure either because a part of me also likes guys like Terrell. The first time I thought about this in a real way was when I went to see Black Lovers, my first real grown concert. And I had this serendipitous, moment-long situationship with this girl. My mom and dad had surprised me with seeing Black Lovers for my 15th birthday. It was an 18 plus show, but apparently the venue allows kids to come with their parents. It made my whole black life that year because this was like one of the first times they'd got me something I actually like. Not some dumb light purple frilly blouse or skinny jeans with floral embroidery on the butt or dangly earrings with pink shells or manicure and pedicure. Actually, side note, I did low-key like that-ish. 
All of that concentrated attention soaking my hands and feet and fingers made me tingle. I found a dope iridescent emerald color called Octopussy, which was a weird name, but it made my nails look like the back of a beetle. So I'm at the show. I have on my black lover shirt, black skinny jeans, and a silver chain with Saturn on it my mom got me for my birthday. My hair was in a braid and I had a big X on my hand to show I wasn't drinking, which I thought was cool anyway. My parents was back in the cut where some of their friends was chilling and they had appetizers and drinks and was just being bougie adults in the way my mom loves and my dad is awkward about. The energy of the show was very intense for me. All I could do was take in all the fly people, their looks and colors. They were beautiful. I had never experienced that ever before. My parents let me wander into the ocean of audience and be free of them, as long as I stayed close to their bougie district or kept my phone handy. I walked around and tried to be low key and blend in, but in that space, part of me wished I had just let loose and pick an edgier outfit. I said excuse me about 99, 11 times and twisted my body through the crowd until I was standing real close to the front, right on the edge of the stage. I wanted to see Queen as close as I could. The wait seemed forever to come, but there was a DJ playing some bops to keep the crowd ready. And when the band got to the stage, I was only a couple feet away from Queen. They were smaller than I thought they would be, but they was also more everything else. More beautiful and dope, and I couldn't stop looking at them. The whole audience seemed to love and want Queen. I mean, my whole body was vibrating. They was all in the zone. Queen didn't seem to notice us at all, except for between songs, when they would talk and tell stories in their deep speaking voice. Otherwise, they would let the guitar talk and harmonize their singing alongside it. I know that's weird, but their song and their voice made it feel like they cared about me. The only way I can explain is that feeling. They're moaning their lyrics behind the bass line. The whole band was going hard and hitting that beat. I felt every note in my gut really underground in me and the whole crowd was feeling it too and I was swept into our collective energy. I'm not gonna lie, I was feeling super awkward because I didn't even know if I knew how to dance at first, but then this girl next to me out of nowhere starts to groove with me. I still know what she, remember what she got on. She was so magical and pretty. She was looking all witchy with a lavender colored fro and white boots and a necklace of mandarin colored flowers. I started dancing back before I could even think about it. She was real smooth with her movements, twirling around me and dropping it in low like bow. I was like, damn. I did a helpless version of my dad's two-step and to my surprise, she seemed impressed. She soul clapped at me even like I was killing it. She smiled and I just kept doing my thing, grinning back at her. And I don't know why I still remember this, but she smelled good too like cocoa butter, jasmine, and little alcohol on her breath, even though there was an X on her hand like mine. All of a sudden, a crew of her friends came back with drinks, and she smiled at me and then floated away among them, and I got pushed further back. It made me feel a little disappointed, but I get it. Those were her homies. But for some silly reason, I had wished we could have danced all night together to black lovers, and I could have maybe even known something about her. Next thing I know, I hear a familiar voice. Mabel, ooh, that is so fresh. I had to get on this dance floor and do my thing, baby. And there was my mama behind me, shimmying an old, twerk, old lady twerking her heart out to the music. <laughs> um, so that's from that, and I have one last piece. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, thank y'all, I always feel like so grateful to read to people, it's special. So this is a poem that is actually going to be a children's book next year, May 2023. And it's interesting because this is a poem I wrote, when did I write this poem? In 2015, actually, after Michael Brown's murderer was acquitted. Um, to me, it was very interesting that the justification for like murdering this child, because at 18 years old, you're a kid, or at least you get to be a kid if you're a white boy shooting up a school. And so was Michael Brown, he was a child. And um, a lot of the justification was that, uh, and I forget the name of the officer now, but he described Michael Brown as like, had superhuman power. 
that like he was almost like, you know, the Hulk or something like that, you know? And I've worked in youth work, I've worked with countless children, and I've worked with 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds and their kids, <laughs> you know? They're people to be loved and definitely not shot on sight, which so often would happen. So I wrote this poem, and then it became a poem that like whenever a black person was murdered, people were like, oh, where's that poem of yours, you know? Um, and it became like kind of like a eulogy poem for my body. Like just every time, it's a beautiful, it's a you know, nice poem, but it's always associated with black death. So anyways, um, when George Floyd passed away, the poem was shared again, um, but now it's gonna be a children's book, which now feels more healing somehow. Like, cause, um, so it's called, Could We Please Give the Police Departments to the Grandmothers? And it's just very much like, was me thinking around if an elder person or a person from community met Michael Brown that day, he, they would have saw a child to love up on and see the humanity in. Um, so anyways, I'm gonna read the poem. And yeah, um, you know, leave y'all for the day. Um, could we please give the police departments to the grandmothers? Give them the salaries and the pensions and the city vehicles, but make them a fleet of vintage Corvettes Jaguars and Cadillacs, white leather interior, diamond in the back, sunroof top, dig in the scene with the gangsta lean. Let the cars be badass. You would hear the old school jams like Patti LaBelle, Anita Baker, and Al Green. You would hear Sweet Honey and the Rock harmonizing on we who believe in freedom will not rest, bumping out the speakers. And they got the booming system. If you up to mischief, they will pick you up swiftly in their sweet ride and look at you until you catch shame and look down at your lap. She asks you if you're hungry, and you say yes, because of course you are. She got a crown of dreadlocks, and on the dashboard you see brown faces like yours, shea buttered and loved up. And there are no precincts, just love temples. They got spaces to meditate and eat delicious food, mangoes, blueberries, nectarines, cornbread, peas and rice, fried plantain, fufu, yams, greens, okra, pecan pie, salad, lemonade, things that make your mouth water and soul arrive. All the hungry bellies know warmth. All the children expect love. The grandmas help you with your homework, practice yoga with you, and teach you how to make jambalaya and coconut cake from scratch. When you're sleepy, she will start humming and rub your back while you drift off. A song that she used to have the record of when she was your age. She remembers how it felt like to be you and be young and not know the world that good. Grandma is a sacred child herself who just circle the sun enough times into the ripeness of her cronehood. She wants your life to be sweeter. When you wildin' out because your heart is broke or you don't have what you need, the grandmas take your hand and lead you to their gardens. You can lay down amongst the flowers. Her grasses, roses, dahlias, irises, lilies, collards, kale, eggplants, blackberries. She wants you to know that you are safe and protected universal, limitless, sacred, sensual, divine, and free. Grandma is the original warrior, wild since birth, comfortable and loving fiercely. She has fought so that you don't have to, not in the same ways at least. So give the police departments to the grandmas. They're fearless, classy, and actualized, blossom from love. They wear what they want and they say what they please. Believe that. There wouldn't be noise citations when the grandmas ride through our streets, blasting Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, Marvin Gaye, Alice Coltrane, Jimi Hendrix, Karis One, all that good music. The kid's gonna hula hoop to it and sell her lemonade made from heirloom pink lemons and maple syrup. The car is solar powered and carbon footprintless. The grandmas designed the technologies themselves. At night, they park the cars in a circle so all can sit in them with the sun roofs down and look at the stars, talk about astrological signs, what to plant tomorrow based on the moon's mood, and help you memorize Audre Lorde and James Baldwin quotes. She always looks you in the eye and acknowledges the light in you with no hesitation or fear. And grandma loves you fiercely. 
She sees the pain in our bravado, the confusion in our anger, the depth behind our coldness. Grandma knows what oppression has done to our souls and is gonna change it one love temple at a time. She has no fear. Happy Juneteenth, everyone. I hope you have a joyous and celebratory turn up for Juneteenth, which also is Pride Month. So I've been calling it Pride Teenth. You can, you can borrow that. All right, y'all. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.